There you go. Order. Members can take their seats as quickly and as quietly as possible. In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. I inform the House that on Friday, 17 February, I received a letter from the Honourable Alan Edward Tudge resigning his seat as the member for the Electoral Division of Aston. On Monday, 27 February, I issued a writ for the election of a member to serve for the Electoral Division of Aston in the State of Victoria to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of the Honourable Alan Edward Tudge. The dates in connection with the by-election will be fixed as follows. The close of rolls today, March 6 March. Close of nominations Thursday, 9 March. Declaration of nominations Friday, 10 March. Date of polling Saturday, 1 April. The return of the writ on or before Wednesday, 7 June. Questions without notice. And I call the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that during the election campaign he solemnly declared, and I quote, we have no intention to make any super changes. Given Labor is now increasing taxes on superannuation, will the Prime Minister apologise for this statement? Why has the Prime Minister misled the Australian people? Isn't this yet another broken promise from this tricky Prime Minister? Order. Order. The House will remain silent so I can hear from the Prime Minister and I give him the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. And I do thank the Leader of the Opposition for his Please. question. We, we have made our priority clear and so has the Leader of the Opposition. Our priority is Order. dealing with the trillion dollars of Liberal debt that we inherited off those opposite. We are making a very Order, modest change. Left. That will Hume. impact one half of one per cent. One half of one per cent. Seventeen Bowman. of those people have over one hundred million dollars in their account. One has over four hundred million dollars. So I, 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 do, I do note that a majority of Australians, including a majority of Liberal voters, say that they agree with this change. But I'll tell you what we won't do. Members on my left. We see an issue of a trillion dollars of Liberal debt. We get advice from Treasury saying that there are these 17 people who have over $100 million in their account. The and, member for O'Connor. And, and we say, well, and the member for well Fisher. we should do Members something about that. Members on my left cease interjecting. Those opposite see the most vulnerable people in our community and introduce the robo debt scheme. And this is what they had to say. We'll find you, we'll track you down, and you will have to repay those debts, and you may end up in prison. That said it all about those opposite and their attitude towards this. We're a government for all Australians. They've been reduced for a government of one half of one per cent. Give the court order. Members on my right. I hear from the member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What steps has the government taken to ease the pressures on Australian families, and is there any opposition to these measures? The member for Fairfax. The member for Fairfax. Order. I know the week's starting. The way this is going to work, people, when they're asking questions, will not be interjected on from both sides. And when people are approaching the dispatch box, they will not be interjected on either. I hope everyone's got that clear today, because that's how this week's going to roll. Give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Cunningham for her question. It was good to be with the member for Cunningham in Wollongong at the university there just a week ago, and to be with the state Labor candidates as well. Uh, there in Wollongong, as well as Kiama in the south coast, just like it was good to be with Chris Mins yesterday at the Labor launch. I look forward to Peter Dutton's contribution, Order. the Leader of the Opposition's contribution at the Liberal Party launch next Sunday. I look forward, I look forward to the red carpet being rolled out there this Sunday. But our biggest priority this year is making sure that Australians have economic security and stability. And that's why we're putting in place measures to take pressure off families so they can plan ahead. We've already acted, but there's more to come. 
Cheaper medicines came in on January 1. Cheaper childcare starts on the 1st of July. Today, through the Senate, this morning, I can inform the House that we pass changes to paid parental leave to allow for more flexibility and easier access for families, particularly for single parents. We're getting wages moving again. We've got more affordable housing. We are, we are implementing our energy price relief plan, opposed by those opposite that one and a half billion dollars that they opposed. And right around Australia, there are young people and older workers being retrained through our fee-free TAFE plan, some 180,000 of them. And this week in Parliament, we'll be progressing our National Reconstruction Fund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very important to address the supply chain issues which the Reserve Bank have identified as being responsible for half and up to two-thirds of the inflationary pressures in the economy. So that's our plan. We have a positive plan going forward. Those opposite just have one answer to everything. No. They say no to manufacturing jobs through the National Reconstruction Member Fund. Perkins. They say no to the Housing Australia Future Fund and additional housing for women and children escaping domestic violence. They say no to power price relief for households. They say no to making super stronger for the future. They say no to ending the climate wars and adopting their own mechanism, their own mechanism that they put in place. No improvements, no alternatives, no ideas, just no. Give a call, Give a call to the Honourable Le Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer to his promise to deliver cheaper mortgages. Interest rates have risen eight times under his watch, and more Order. Australians are turning to Food Bank so they can put their grocery money towards their mortgage payments. Why has this Prime Minister misled the Australian people? Isn't this yet another broken promise by this tricky Prime Minister? Order. The member for Fisher. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker. And perhaps uh, if the Deputy Leader attends the New South Wales Liberal Party launch on Sunday, uh, and she might get to speak, then she will get to speak about the shared equity scheme which I announced Order. during our election campaign and the shared equity scheme that is being promoted by the Liberal National Government in New South Wales. Shared equity schemes, what, what it means is, instead of having 100 per cent of the mortgage yourself, there's a share of the mortgage is held by the government. That's the scheme. That's the scheme. That's the scheme that New Manager South Wales business. Liberal government has announced. It's based upon the WA Liberal Party scheme. It's based upon the Victorian scheme. The WA scheme has been in place for many, many decades and has been a huge success. And I thank the member for her question. Order, members on my left. Give it. The member for Longman. Give the call to the member for Dunkley. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. What are the pressures on the Australian economy, and what is the Albanese Labor government's economic plan to address the inflation challenge in our economy? Give a call to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I say to the member for Dunkley that her dedication and her determination is an inspiration to all of us? And can I say? From a personal level, thank you for all of the help and advice that she gives me when it comes to our economic plans and policies as well. I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, Mr Speaker, the national accounts last week showed growth in the Australian economy moderating as expected. The inevitable consequence of the combination of global challenges and high inflation and rising interest rates. Now, our economy in the December quarter grew by 2.7 per cent throughout 2022, faster than all of the major advanced economies and more than twice the growth of the OECD average. But it's a sign of the times, Mr Speaker, that even in one of the world's best economies, the inflationary pressures coming at us from around the world are still being felt very acutely around the kitchen tables of this country. 
Now, we know that the tightening in interest rates that began before the election is adding to the pressure okay, on many people and on many small businesses as well. Australians are under the pump, and when interest rates go up, it does make life that bit harder. Now, tomorrow, as honourable members are aware, the Reserve Bank will make its decision on interest rates. We don't preempt those decisions, but clearly the market Member is Barker. anticipating a further increase. Now, the bank takes its decisions independently, and that independence is Barker. an important feature of our economic system. The government's job, the job that this government has taken responsibility for and embraced, is to focus on what we can do in government to get on top of this inflation challenge. Now, there are welcome signs, Mr Speaker, that the inflation challenge in our economy has peaked. There are encouraging signs that we are getting on top of it, but inflation will be higher than we'd like for longer than we'd like, and we need to acknowledge that. So our three-point plan is all about relief for people doing it tough, repair of our broken supply chains and restraint in the budget as well. And a meaningful part of that budget restraint was our decision on superannuation last week. Now, this was a modest change and a sensible choice for a budget which is absolutely heaving with a trillion dollars in Liberal Party debt. When Australians are doing it tough, Labor's highest priority is targeted cost of living relief in a more responsible budget. The Liberals' highest priority is bigger tax breaks for people who already have tens of millions of dollars in superannuation. The Treasurer will pause. The members on my right. Um, I'll hear from the manager of Opportunity Business. Well, Mr. Speaker, the question went to pressures on the economy and the Albanese Labor government's plan to address pressures on the economy. The Treasurer is now wandering into an attack on this side of the House. He's a serial offender and he should be brought back to the question. I could not hear what the Premier. Uh, what the... <laughs> Don't tell the Premier that. Um, I couldn't. <laughs> Order! <laughs> Order. I couldn't hear what the Treasurer was saying, but I draw him back to the question. I won't tell her if you won't, Mr Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Speaker, our plan is to make a modest change to tax concessions for people with millions of dollars in their super to make the system more sustainable and more affordable. It's all about making the budget more responsible in the context of these cost of living pressures which are impacting people right around the country. Those opposite have got a different plan. They go after people with robo-debt and they come after Medicare. Yeah. Order. Before I call the member for McCallum, I'm pleased to inform the House that present in the gallery today is the Canberra Fellowships Parliamentary Delegation from Indonesia, led by Mr Charles Hores. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. And I give the call to the member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. This morning I introduced a bill to end the jobs for mates culture in federal politics. Having abolished the AAT because of rampant cronyism and announced a review into public board appointments, it appears the government agrees this is a major integrity problem. Without a legislated and independent process like I have proposed in my bill, how can the government guarantee that any future appointments to public institutions will not end up as more jobs for mates? And I give the call to the Attorney General. I thank the member very th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member very much for her question. Uh, as she knows, we have met to discuss her private member's bill. And uh, as I have explained to her and would explain to the House, we as a government are committed to merit-based, transparent appointment processes. You will see those merit-based, transparent appointment processes Order. in all left. respects in the appointments of this government. Order. Give a call to the member for Patterson. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry. What's the Albanese Labor government doing to revitalise Australian manufacturing? Why is this important for manufacturing jobs? And what are the threats to creating these new jobs? Order. I give the call to the Minister for Industry and Science. Thanks, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Paterson. This is a member that gets it. Member for Patterson understands manufacturing matters, and there are thousands of people 
employed across the Hunter who owe their livelihoods to manufacturing, and some really great firms like Energy Renaissance in the members' electorate who are looking to have Aussie-made batteries right here available for us. Great work. Revitalising manufacturing is a critical priority for the country. Some of the world's biggest economies owe their success to having very healthy manufacturing within them, and they also get these countries they need to become more self-sufficient. And the Albanese government gets this too. It's uh, one of the reasons why we don't want our country to be reliant on concentrated or broken supply chains. And dealing with this is a big part of our plan to take up the fight on inflation and also put downward pressure on interest rates. It's why we're, for example, calling on the parliament to join with us in setting up the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund, yeah. one of the greatest investments in national Order. manufacturing capability and living memory. And the growth capital that will be unlocked by the National Reconstruction Fund, crucial, good for the economy, good for industry and unbelievably good for jobs. Nearly 900,000 Australians employed as a result of manufacturing in over 90,000 firms, one third of which are employed outside of our capital cities. Our national ambition should be to see that number grow in our outer suburbs, in our regions, in remote Australia. Our other ambition to, is, should be to keep Australian companies onshore. Good ideas, jobs here, made in Australia, made overseas. That's the big thing. That's the big difference. And I've met Australian businesses here and overseas who want a future made in Australia. Those firms, uh, some of which have moved overseas, will sometimes cite how hard it is to get growth capital the they need the on home soil, which is precisely the issue the National Reconstruction Fund wants to deal with. This government knows how much Australians can't stand it when Australian firms have to leave our shores for a lack of support. Most Australians get it, except, it seems, the Liberal and National parties. The same parties who pushed auto manufacturing offshore, presided over a Order. decade of neglect, voted against Incorrect energy honour. price relief to help manufacturers, and now they want to oppose manufacturers getting access to growth by the NRF. No to manufacturing, no to jobs, no to growth, no to Australian know-how. And when it comes to supporting the NRF and Australian manufacturing, those opposites say no way, no how. I would just ask manufacturers from our outer suburbs and regions who might be represented by a Liberal and National Party MP just to ask those MPs why they only ever support manufacturing when there's a TV camera around. Order. Order. Give the call to the member for Cowper. Prime Minister, Ross and Cynthia are aged pensioners who live in South West Rocks in my electorate. This week they were told by their provider their new power bill is about to skyrocket by more than 40 per cent to $474 per quarter. The Prime Minister promised Australians like Ross and Cynthia that he would cut their power bills by $275. Why has the Prime Minister misled the Australian people, and isn't this yet another pro broken promise by this tricky Prime Minister? Order. Members on my left, I give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for his question, and I do hope that the member told Ross and Cynthia that he voted against $1.5 billion of energy price relief. Order. I hope he did. I hope he the did. The member for Groom will stop because yelling. That was a plan. The member for Groom that went through. Will cease interjecting. Went through every every state and territory leader, Labor and Liberal. It's true there are no Nats there, so we don't know where the Nats would have stood. But every state Liberal leader, including the Premier of New South Wales, voted for this plan. And indeed, responsible oppositions, such as the New South Wales opposition, voted for the plan as well. And you know what's happened as a result of the plan is that, as a result of us announcing it, wholesale, wholesale prices, wholesale prices have halved as a result. As a result, and this is what Philip Lowe, the RBA governor, had to say uh, just last week. Order. He said this. This episode of high inflation has its origins mainly in developments on the supply side, something that the Minister for Industry was just talking about. But over time, 
demand side factors have become more prominent. It emerged in the wake of the COVID supply chain disruptions and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That is what the Reserve Bank Governor said last Friday. Now, we are dealing with that in a practical way. We brought forward legislation and indeed brought the parliament back here last December for extraordinary action due to the extraordinary circumstances which were there. Uh, you didn't. Order. Members on you my voted left against cease one and a half billion dollars of assistance, and I hope you've told your constituents that. Order. It's far too much noise on my left. I'll hear from the member for Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local, Go Local Government. How will the National Reconstruction Fund deliver jobs and investment to communities across regional Australia? And why would any regional Australians be opposed to this investment? Give a call to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Hunter, who's making an enormous contribution to this place. It's so fantastic to have another regional member who understands just how important that uh, how important Order. that manufacturing is to our regions, unlike those opposite. Uh, it's why we are so determined to make sure that one of the key positive changes that Australians voted for at the last election is actually introduced, and that is the National Reconstruction Fund. It's a $15 billion fund that will provide finance to projects that will diversify and transform Australia's industry and our economy, securing our supply chains and increasing our national sovereignty when it comes to manufactured goods. It will make Australia more productive, it will give Australians more jobs, and it means that we will make more things here in this country. The fund will be the biggest investment in manufacturing capability in living memory. So why would anyone be opposed to it? When you look at the priority areas for investment, you can clearly see that the vast be benefits will flow to regional Australians. Value adding in critical minerals, agriculture, forestry and fisheries, defence and transport, renewables and low emissions technologies. All of these industries are focused in regional Australia. Just last week, I held a roundtable to guide the establishment of the Jet Zero Council here in Australia. The meeting included representatives of airlines, our airports, investors, feedstock producers, scientists and fuel producers, all unified by a desire to grow a sustainable aviation fuel industry here in this country to help what is a really hard-to-abate sector. It is exactly the kind of industry that the National Reconstruction Fund, alongside the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, can be supporting. And that is good news for regional Australia because that is exactly where the jobs will be. Sugar cane, sugar milling in North Queensland, canola in Western Australia and tallow all across the country. It can all be used to create sustainable aviation fuel and all can be the engine room for a new generation of clean jobs, clean energy and clean manufacturing here in this country. It's just one example of one industry. But there are jobs and opportunities that should be unleashed right the way across Australia, and the National Reconstruction Fund will do just that. With all of those benefits, why would anyone be opposed to the National Reconstruction Fund? Who wouldn't want to see more jobs and investment in regional Australia? Who wouldn't want to see more regional manufacturing? Who wouldn't want to see regional Australia benefit from manufacturing jobs? Those opposite, that's who. Critical order. Members on my right. I give the call to the member for Hume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. He's a light one. On, on the 30th of March 2021, the Prime Minister said we won't have any changes to the franking credits regime. Why has the Prime Minister misled the Australian people? Isn't this yet another broken promise from a tricky Prime Minister? Order. Members on my right. The member for Deakin, I give the call to the Prime Minister. Proposed by the, by the former government, but then again, then again, the, the shadow treasurer. I mean, the treasurer has been waiting patiently there since last November 
to get a single it's question. November. Last November. It's now March. It was his birthday last week. It was his birthday. On the same day. Give him a question. Give him a question. That's all he asked. That's all he asked for, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister will return to the question. The Members on my left. I would have thought. I would have thought that the shadow treasurer might have asked a question about super. He's had a lot to say. He's had a lot to say about super. He's had a lot to say about super, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister will return to the question. But, it, but apparently, uh, but apparently not. Well, he's just picked another argument about with himself. But he picked an argument with himself accidentally, accidentally last week, uh, as well for the entire week. At last, a fair fight. At last, a fair fight. A fight between the shadow treasurer with the shadow treasurer. I think they've only got one. I think they've only got one now. Uh, Angus versus Angus. A true battle of the lightweights. <laughs> the call the member for Spence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Order. How is the Albanese Order. Labor government Order. ensuring the, member for the response? Resume his seat. It's far too much noise. If people interject whilst people are asking questions, they will be removed from the chamber immediately. I can't be any clearer than that. I'll hear from the member for Spence again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. How is the Albanese Labor government ensuring the responsible delivery of AUKUS, and are there threats to this responsible approach? I give the call to the Minister for Defence and Deputy Prime Minister. Well, can I thank the member for his question. Bipartisanship in Order. national security is critical, and that's not a leave pass for governments. Criticism from opposition Order. matters. Indeed, there was profoundly important criticism the from the Curtin opposition to the Menzies government in the first years of the Second World War. But even then, it was understood that on critical issues, bipartisanship mattered. Now, when the Morrison government made its AUKUS announcement last year that Australia would acquire nuclear-powered submarines, the Albanese Labor opposition provided unconditional, unqualified support immediately, and that continued right through until the election. But over the last week, the attitude of the opposition to AUKUS has become quite unclear as we have been hearing the Leader of the Order. Opposition describe Order. his preferences about a future submarine capability. Order. And this Members has raised left. eyebrows Kim. abroad about whether or not the Coalition is on board. Now, the last time the Order. Leader of the Opposition received a confidential briefing about AUKUS was in the very early days of a process well, which has gone a long way since then. Stop yelling. The Leader of the Opposition's information is very out of date, and he knows it. This government inherited an AUKUS announcement without much delivery. The capability gap, which loomed as a result of the lost decade from those opposite as they were in and out of a subs deal with Japan, in and out of a deal with France, had absolutely no answer business. to it. And there was the real prospect of there being a contest between two of our closest friends and allies as to who would provide us with the submarine. Well, I can inform the House that the announcement that we will soon make will deal with the capability gap and is a genuine collaboration between all three countries. The difference between the Coalition's announcement on AUKUS and every other announcement that they made on defence in the last 10 years is that this time Labor is going to do the delivery, and so it's actually going to happen. Over the last Order. week, we've watched the Leader of the Opposition lay down markers, hedge his bets, try to have it both ways. Well, the question for the Opposition is very simple. When the government makes its announcement with the United States and with the United Kingdom about the future submarine capability that Australia has, Member will the Herbert. opposition provide unconditional and unqualified support so as to provide bipartisan support in the national interest, or will they continue their subterranean commentary so as to position themselves for their own political interest? Well, that choice is all theirs. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Oh, to the Leader of the Opposition. 
You're on, you're on fire today, Mr Speaker. Order. Well done, Mr Speaker. I seek leave to move the following motion. Mr Speaker, that the House one notes that before the election, the Prime Minister promised on 97 occasions to reduce Australians' power bills by $275. But instead, power bills have increased since he became Prime Minister. B, that before the election, the Prime Minister promised Australians cheaper mortgages, but instead there have been eight successive increases in mortgage interest rates since Order. he became Prime Minister. C, that before the election, the Prime Minister promised Australians that he would not raise taxes on superannuation, and last week the Prime Minister announced a new tax on superannuation. Order. Two notes that this Prime Minister is showing himself on issue after issue to be untrustworthy and deceptive, having told Australians one thing before the election and doing the opposite of what he promised now he's in government. Three notes that as a result of the Prime Minister's conduct, Australians are now unable to trust any of the promises he made and therefore calls on this Prime Minister to keep the promises he has made, including in relation to reduced power bills cheaper mortgages and not introducing new taxes on superannuation. Is leave granted? That, that was a request for leave. So the Leader of the Opposition requested leave. Yeah, yeah. leave granted. Leave's not granted. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I, I seek leave, uh, Mr Speaker. Sorry, I, I move, rather, that so much of the standing right. orders be, suspending as would, would be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving the following Order. motion forth with. Right, we'll Mr. Speaker. The Mr. Speaker. Will cease interjecting. One notes that before the election, the Prime Minister promised on 97 occasions to reduce Australians' power bills by $275. But instead, power bills have increased since he became Prime Minister. B. That before the election, the Prime Minister promised Australians cheaper mortgages, but instead, there have been eight successive increases in mortgage interest rates since he became Prime Minister. C. That before the election, the Prime Minister promised Australians that he would not raise taxes on superannuation, and last week the Prime Minister announced a new tax on superannuation. Two notes that this Prime Minister is showing himself on issue after issue to be untrustworthy and deceptive, having told Australians one thing before the election and doing the opposite of what he promised, now he's in government. Three notes that, as a result of the Prime Minister's conduct, Australians are now unable to trust any of the promises he made, and therefore four calls on the Prime Minister to keep the promises he has made, including in relation to reduced power bills, cheaper mortgages and not introducing new taxes on superannuation. Mr Speaker, I just, the reality— Just pause for a moment. Just call the Leader of the House. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, understanding Order 47E, I require that this debate be continued at the conclusion of question time. Order. The, the Leader will resume his seat and we will, we will order, resume your seat. And I, order. 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 I give the call to the member for Newcastle. Yeah. Thank you. And my question is to the Minister for Housing and Homelessness. Why is the Albanese government's $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund so important, and how does it fit into the government's larger housing reform agenda after a decade of so little action? I give the call yeah. to the Minister for Housing, the Minister for Homelessness and the Minister for Small Business. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Newcastle for her important question because I know that she, like many members in this place, is concerned that far too many Australians are paying the price of little action from those opposite when it comes to social and affordable housing. Indeed, our government was elected with a real plan to help tackle the, housings, the country's housing challenges. Indeed, a plan to establish the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund. I want to thank all of those in this place that supported the Housing Australia Future Fund in this place. And indeed, we know it's going to make a real difference, Mr Speaker. As National Shelter has said, the package of legislation being considered by the Senate is the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward in the past 10 years. We're talking here about the single biggest investment in social and affordable housing in more than a decade. 
and we know how critical it is because it's going to make a real difference to those that need it most. But of course, the 30,000 homes that the fund will deliver in its first five years is just one part of our broader housing agenda. We've already unlocked up to $575 million from the National Housing Infrastructure Facility, the and we've already made announcements right around the country of more social houses because of that unlocking. Of course, in the last budget, we announced the Housing Accord, 10,000 affordable homes Order. additional, and that will be matched by the states and territories with another 10,000 affordable homes. And of course, we're working with the states and territories on the future of the $1.6 billion per annum in the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. Hear, hear. The interim National Supply and Affordability Council has already had its first meeting, and of course, it will be providing independent advice to tiers of government about how to make housing more affordable and how to get more homes on the ground more quickly. The Council will also provide advice, critical advice, into the new National Housing and Homelessness Plan that will fit with the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. And of course, our regional first home buyer guarantee that we brought forward, Mr. Speaker. 2,000 Australians are already in their first home sooner because of that guarantee. Indeed, the Help to Buy scheme will soon be introducing to support eligible Australians to purchase their own home sooner. It's astounding to me, Mr. Speaker, that we've still got people on the other side that are saying no to our agenda, particularly the Housing Australia Future Fund. Indeed, they're saying no to more homes for women and children fleeing family violence. Order. They're saying no to more homes for Order. women Members and children at risk of homelessness. They're saying no to building more homes for veterans who are at risk of homelessness. Indeed, they're saying no Members to more my Australians, left. particularly those Australians that are doing it tough, that are relying on this social and affordable housing. Every single day we delay in this place means no, no homes on the ground for people that need it critically, and those on the opposite need to say yes in the Senate when the legislation gets there next week. I give the call to the honourable member for Ryan. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Environment Minister. Recently, you quietly issued late on a Friday afternoon your decision to approve Labor Party donor Santos a licence to frack. 116 uh, new gas wells in Queensland until 2077. The International Energy Agency recently showed that Australia's methane emissions from coal and gas could be 60 per cent higher than now accounted for. Why are you approving new gas wells that will make the climate crisis worse? Here, here. <laughs> give the call to the Minister for the Environment and Water. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I think the first thing to say is that imputation is unworthy and insulting. The second thing I'd like to point out to the honourable member Order. is that the project she's talking about is a 1.3 per cent expansion of a project that's been going for eight years. A 1.3 per cent expansion of a project that has been going for eight years. To listen to the member opposite, you'd think it was something quite left. different. But I will say to the Greens, as they're sitting there feeling self-righteous, that the very best thing the Greens political party could do, if they were really interested in climate change in this country, is back the government's safeguard yeah. mechanism. Those sitting Order. up there in that corner should not make the same mistake they made in 2009 when they voted with Tony Abbott and Barnaby Joyce to block action on climate change. Because what they delivered last time was more emissions for longer and a Liberal government. That's what they delivered last time. I am proud of what we're doing on this side of the parliament. It's the Albanese Labor government that is delivering real action on climate change with a legislated path to net zero emissions, with a, uh, with a pledge on methane, with real action to protect the ozone layer with $20 billion to rewire the nation so we can put more renewable energy into our electricity market, with $3 billion in the National Reconstruction Fund to support uh, low emissions technologies. Are you going to vote for that? Are you going to vote for the $3 billion for low emissions technologies? 
why don't you answer that question? Order. The best thing, the, the best thing, the best thing that those opposite can do, if they sincerely want to see real action on climate change, is Order. support the government's safeguard mechanism. Don't make the same mistake as 2009. Back the National Reconstruction Fund and get on board for our measures addressing climate change. Give the call to the member for Bendigo. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Veteran Affairs. What support is the Albanese Labor government providing to veterans and their families who are at risk of homelessness? Give the call to the Minister for Veterans Affairs and the Minister for Defence Personnel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Bendigo for this important question and for her ongoing advocacy for the veterans and families in her electorate. And of course, we understand that rising cost of living pressures and higher interest rates are hitting a lot of Australians hard including our veteran community. The Albanese Labor government is, has an ambitious reform for housing to make sure that more Australians can have safe and affordable place to call home. Indeed, nearly 6,000 contemporary veterans can experience homelessness in any one year. And so the Department of Veterans Affairs is working with the community housing sector, including through a partnership with the Community Housing Industry Association and ex-service organisations to develop veteran-specific resources to assist community housing providers in supporting veterans who are experiencing homelessness. These resources also introduce an industry standard for providing housing services to veterans. And if you are a veteran that is experiencing homelessness, please do get in touch with the Department of Veterans Affairs on 1800 838 372 or on open arms on 1800 011 046. But to be frank, we don't actually want to find ourselves in a position where veterans are homeless. Things shouldn't have to get that far. The Australian government strives to ensure that all former serving members of our Australian Defence Force who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness have access to the services and the support that they and their families require. That's why we're investing $3.6 million to build the Scott Palmer Services Centre a crisis and transitional housing and support service to help veterans find permanent accommodation and employment in Darwin. It's why our $30 million commitment to build more housing and fund specialist service services for veterans and families who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness is so very important. And that's just one part of our $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund. This is the single biggest investment in social and affordable housing by a federal government in more than a decade. And there are some excellent organisations around Australia who are standing by to provide housing relief to our veterans and want to provide that support. These organisations have proposals, proposals just like the Scott Palmer Centre in Darwin or the existing Andrew Russell Veterans Living Program in South Australia, but they're hamstrung without the passage of the Housing Australia Future Fund legislation. Indeed, even the member for Jagger Jagger came and approached me the other day with another program that could support veterans experiencing homelessness. People have examples of these around the country. But for some unfathomable reason, the opposition wants to stand in the way of more coordinated support for veterans who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. Order. Every day that we have to wait is another day that veterans have to wait to get access to the support they need for homelessness because of this opposition. Yeah. Yeah. Give the call to the honourable member for Flinders. My question is to the Prime Minister. Before the election, the Prime Minister said he would stand by the legislative stage three tax cuts. Will the Prime Minister rule out any changes to the stage three tax cuts, or will this be the next broken promise? From this tricky Prime Minister. Order. Order. Give a call to the Prime Minister. Thank, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I thank the member for Flinders for her question. And we've made our priority very clear. And so have the Liberals. We now have, we now have the first commitment from the Leader of the Opposition, which is on tax issues. He will, he will if, if he's successful at the next the election, with Bowman the support, I assume, of the member for Flinders, if she's successful, the members on my left. He, will introduce, he will introduce better tax concessions 
for those people who have $100 million in their bank account, now, in their super account. Member for Hume. So he finally, Order. having gone through, having gone through, the leader of the opposition will cease an interjecting. Entire, almost a year as opposition leader, having had his first budget reply without having a single policy to put forward, Order. we now have one, and we expected some questions the about Prime it Minister today. Pause. The member for Groom is on a warning and is on thin ice. Order. If the member for Hume doesn't want me to hear the manager of opposition business, keep going. Call the manager of opposition business. Uh, Mr Speaker, on relevance, very tightly defined, will the Prime Minister rule out any changes to the stage three tax cuts? He's avoiding doing that. He's Order. equivocating. I'll hear from the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, to the point of order, it's always been the case that when there's a tag of that nature, it opens the question right wide up. Order. The Prime Minister is in order. I'm struggling to hear his answer. I'm asking the House to show some respect. I give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Um, of course, we haven't changed our position on, on that issue. The, uh, but uh, we do find the member we're for will leave the chamber under a group of people who the opposition will fight for. <laughs> he won't fight for those veterans at risk of homelessness that we just discussed about. He won't fight for those women and children escaping domestic violence who will benefit from the Housing Australia Future Fund. He won't fight for those people in regional Australia who want manufacturing jobs in the National Reconstruction Fund. He won't fight for those businesses who are calling for certainty with the safeguard mechanism. He won't fight for those families who want cheaper childcare. He wouldn't fight for those families Order. who will benefit from energy price relief. No to all of them. We've found a group that he'll fight for. The 17, million, the 17 Australians who have over $100 million in their superannuation accounts. And the one Australian, he probably knows who it is, probably knows who it is, who has over $400 million in his, bank, in his super account. I mean, Order. They have, they Member have Barker, consistently, they have consistently opposed absolutely everything. But finally, they've found something that they're in favour of. But they come in here, having, 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 having got on on every every interview with a friendly journalist they could find over the last week. Over the last week. They come in here Order. and it's almost radio the, the silence on Super. Time almost radio has silence. Concluded. What a pathetic. Order. Order. Members on my left will cease interjecting. Order. 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 The member for Deakin and the Prime Minister will cease interjecting. I give the call to the member for Chisholm. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. How is the Albanese Labor government working to ensure Australia is on track to meet our emissions reduction targets? Why is policy certainty so critical in this area? Great question. Great question. I give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for her question. I know because she and I have discussed it, how important it was for her in one of her first acts in this parliament to vote with the government and the crossbench to pass our Climate Change Act, which enshrines our targets in the law of the land. And now the task, of course, Mr Speaker, is to implement those targets and get on with the job. And an important part of doing that is the government's safeguard reforms, Mr Speaker, which, of course, cover around a third of our emissions, our 200, 200 biggest emitters across Australia, and our reforms will reduce emissions by 2030 by 205 million tonnes, which is very important to achieving those targets. And importantly, Mr. Speaker, the House and the Senate will get a chance to vote on an element of those reforms, which is below the baseline crediting, which is the incentive for businesses to reduce 
their emissions even further than they are required to by the law by the government. And this is very important, Mr Speaker, and the honourable member asked me about the need for certainty, and the need for certainty is very clear in regard to this, and certainty on, regard, on behalf of all members of the House, Mr Speaker. And in relation to the one matter in which the House will get a chance to vote on this matter, in relation to the legislation, we've always been very clear that we give credit where it's due. This was a policy of the previous government as well, to reduce these baselines. In fact, not only was it a policy they announced in government, it was a policy they announced during the election campaign, Mr Speaker. Not just the Liberal Party, the coalition, the official LNP coalition policy said we will legislate safeguard crediting mechanism. Mr. Speaker. That was the policy released on 24 April 2022. Mr. Speaker. That was their policy, and, and there has been, been even more developments. Mr. Speaker. We heard not so long ago from our old friend, the member for Hume. Always, always a crowd favourite on this side of the House. Mr. Speaker. We look forward to his interviews with eager anticipation. Might not be unanimous to you across the house, but on this side of the house, we look forward to them. And he went further. He not only he not only said it was their policy. He claimed they'd already legislated it when they were in government. Mr. Speaker, he said we had on the 20 on the 7th of February this year. He said we had a crediting mechanism that was very effective and it worked. Mr. Speaker, he claimed they'd already legislated it when in fact they had not. So those Order. opposite have gone from saying they would legislate it to saying they had legislated it, to now saying they're against legislating it, Mr Speaker. <laughs> this is the policy consistency we've got from those opposite. Now, we know they had 22 energy policies in nine years. They've had three policies on safeguards in three weeks, Mr Speaker. If you're going to be the alternative government of Australia, you have to have some consistency. You have to have a little bit of logic, Mr Speaker. Under this through the opposition, they have none of any of the above. Give the call to the member for Kuyong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Health. Order. The member for Keong will resume her seat. The member for Riverina will cease interjecting when members are asking questions. I'll give the call to the member for Kuyong. I'm sorry? I'll give the call to the member for Kuyong to begin your question. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I give the call to the member. <laughs> order. I give the call to the member for Kuyong. I'll be there before you are. My question. Order. Order. When the house, when the house comes to order, the member for Kuyong will be heard in silence. Order. Order. I'm sorry, I can't hear. All right. We'll do this again. I give the call to the member for Kuyong. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Health. Minister, Australians are struggling with the cost of living pressures. In 2018, the PBAC recommended allowing prescribing of, of two months of a time supply for 143 medications. This would save dispensing fees of up to $180 a year per prescription medicine and it will take pressure off GPs. Will you commit to dis decreasing health care costs by making this change to the PBAC? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. I give the call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. We, we, you think they'd have learned about uh, interjecting on the member for Kuyong? <laughs> But this is an opposition that doesn't appear to learn, Mr. Speaker. Order. Uh, I thank the member for Kuyong for her question, uh, and I and I appreciate Order. the members contribution that members of the crossbench, uh, particularly those with such long experience uh, as health professionals, are making to a really difficult debate about healthcare right now. It's never been harder to see a doctor. It's never been more expensive to see a doctor. And at a time of really severe cost of living pressures, just those basic questions about whether you can take a script to your pharmacist and have it filled, or whether that will place too much of a burden on your household budget, are real pressures on hundreds of thousands of Australians. Uh, we've heard from the ABS that almost a million Australians every year either defer or go without 
a script that their doctor has given them as important for their health because of household budget pressures. Now, for the first time in 75 years, on 1 January, there was a substantial cut to the price of general patient scripts, down from $42.50 to $30, and already uh, that has saved tens of millions of dollars for uh, many, many Australians. It made a real difference not only to their household budget but, importantly, to their health care as well. The member for Kuyong is right that the PBAC has made um, other suggestions about ways in which that cost of living pressure but also the convenience, the convenience of patients um, can be improved and those pressures can be alleviated uh, in terms of the number of times they need to go to GPs, get scripts or go to the pharmacist to have their medicines topped up. Uh, we're obviously looking at all of those options. There's a budget process underway. We're looking at all of the options available to government uh, to make uh, access to health care better and easier for patients and to make the cost of health care, including the cost of medicines, even cheaper. So I'm not in a position to make any particular announcements this afternoon, Mr Speaker, uh, but I thank the member for Kuyong for her question. These are all matters that we take very, very seriously because we know, in spite of the fact that the change we introduced on 1 January has already had an enormous impact, enormous beneficial impact on patients, a, a change supported very strongly by the community pharmacy sector. There is much more that we can do, and we're examining all of those options very closely. Order. Order. The member for Fairfax and the member for Lindsay will cease interjecting, and the, min and the minister for health will cease interjecting. So I can hear from the member for Bean. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Government Services. What has the Royal Commission into Robo-Debt uncovered about what was said in public by former ministers in charge of the unlawful scheme versus what they actually believed? And how many robo-debts were raised between the 29th of May 2019 and the 19th of November 2019? You give the call to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the Minister for Government Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Bean for his question. In the most recent block of hearings at the Royal Commission into Robo-Debt, we've heard from Professor René Leon, former Secretary of the Department of Human Services, Timothy French, DHS Legal Counsel, and the member for Fadden, then the Minister for Human Services. Specifically, Mr French testified that in a meeting in early July 2019, the member for Fadden was verbally briefed that the Australian government solicited opinion that robo-debt was on very shaky grounds, testimony which Professor Leon corroborated in her own, in her own evidence. Further evidence was led that on July 31st the member for Fadden appeared on the ABC's Insider program defending RoboDebt and stating, amongst other things, that in 99.2 per cent of the cases the debt was correct—99.2 per cent, he said. However, last week, under questioning by the Royal Commissioner, the member for, Matt, for Fadden admitted that he knew that what he was saying was false. The Royal Commissioner said, and I quote, Commissioner, your evidence was that you could not raise a debt based solely on averaging. Member for Fadden, that was my belief, yes. Commissioner, and in 90 per cent of those cases, that is exactly what was happening under the program, to your knowledge. Minister, that is correct. Commissioner, so what you said there, to your knowledge, at the time was false. Minister, and this is very, very, very interesting. My personal view, yes but I'm still a government minister. And it is still a government program, and that was the approach the government had signed off on. The basic position of the evidence of the member for Fadden was that Cabinet solidarity allowed him as a minister to give statistics that he did not Order. believe on robo-debt to the Australian— Immediately. I'll hear from the manager of opposition business. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, you've given a ruling uh, on several occasions on this matter. You've said what you are less comfortable with is putting Order. a construction on the evidence or the drawing of conclusions about the conduct of individuals yeah. who are parties to the proceedings. Now, I've listened very carefully to what the minister has had to say, and he has now crossed that line, and he should be uh, reminded of your ruling, and he should comply with it, Mr Speaker. I'm just going to ask the minister to... 
either state from the transcript or give a page number or something to do with the order so I can hear him in silence from the chamber. So if he does cross the line into giving a statement about a concluded view, he will be brought to order. But I give him the call now. I say this in all collegiality, but I thank the, uh, the manager for opposition business for giving me the chance to go to the precise quote. Minister for, uh, Member for Fadden, at page 4220, they were the numbers from the department based on the working approach and how the program was being run. That was the accepted figures. And as a dutiful cabinet minister, ma'am, that's what we do. Then the commissioner replies, misrepresent things to the Australian people. The evidence was very idiosyncratic for the member for, Sa the member for Fadden. The story that was being put in the Royal Commission last week is that there's a doctrine of collective ministerial responsibility that allowed the previous Order. government to mislead the people. Order. The, the minister cannot. Has the minister concluded his answer? The, the, minister, the, the minister has concluded his answer. Order. I want to hear from the member for Mallee. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. For more than 20 years, Ian Mortlock has operated a tomato growing business in my electorate. Under this government, Ian's company endured a 400 per cent rise in gas prices for his last contract. He has been quoted a new price, but despite the government's much hyped gas price caps, it's still so high it will damage his business. The Prime Minister promised Australians like Ian that he would cut their power bills by $275. Why has the Prime Minister misled the Australian people? Isn't this yet another broken promise Order. by this Member tricky Ruggie Prime Mercy. Minister? Just remind the member she was well out of time with that question. The, there, was, there, was a, there, was a, there was a question at the end. I'm just going to ask, order. For the point of, for the point of clarity, I'm just going to ask the, the member just to state the question. Why has the Prime Minister misled the Australian people? Isn't this yet another broken promise by this tricky Prime Minister? It's a very broad question. I give the call to the Prime Minister. We brought the parliament back last December to put a cap on gas prices. That's right. We put it, it back. Said it was. Order. We put it members back. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The Prime member opposite voted against it. The member the opposite the also voted against the one the point leader five of the opposition. billion dollars, one point five billion dollars of energy price relief. That the Order. member opposite voted against. So I hope that Order. the member tells her company the that she Hume. voted against the cap on gas prices and that she voted against the one and a half billion dollars of energy price relief. Order. We'll hear from the member for Cornwall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. How important is it for ministers to act in accordance with the law? I give the call order. I give the call to the Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Corwell for her question. When we set up the Robo Debt Royal Commission shortly after coming to government, the degree of dishonesty and shocking lack of probity and lack of integrity of the former Liberal government was already very well known. But the painstaking work of this Royal Commission has uncovered an even greater degree of wrongdoing than many of us had anticipated. Last week, the member for Fadden revealed to the Commission that while he was the minister responsible in 2019, he had serious doubts about the legality of the robo-debt scheme. And despite those doubts, this is what he also revealed. The member for Padden continued to publicly defend the scheme 
and use fake statistics that he knew to be false. When asked about this at the Royal Commission, the member for Fadden said, Cabinet made me do it. I, I can reassure this House that there is nothing— Order. The Attorney-General will take a break and I'll hear from the Manager of Opposition Business. Well, Mr Speaker, again the principle is that a minister should not be putting a construction on the evidence or the drawing of conclusions. Now, uh, I, will, I will give the, the member for Maribyrnong credit that he was uh, quoting from precise uh, verbatim pieces of evidence. Uh, you would have thought the first law right, officer your, of the resume, nation would also adopt that same principle. Resume your seat. Just remind all ministers not to give a concluded view whilst the Royal Commission is underway. And I'd ask the minister to refer to, directly to evidence in his answer, and I give him a call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would refer to uh, transcript pages at the commission, pages the four two one nine to four two two zero. The damage done by behaviour that we've seen revealed at this royal commission weakens the bond of trust between voters and elected representatives. Voters are entitled to the most basic expectations the, that those in power the abide manager, by the, the law. Leader, the Attorney General will resume his seat. The Minister for Skills will cease interjecting. I'll hear from the manager. Mr Speaker, it is extraordinary this point needs to be made about the conduct of the first law officer of the land, but the Royal Commission Order. is specifically tasked with finding facts and drawing conclusions. And for this reason, you have rightly ruled, as have previous speakers, that there is a distinction to be drawn between reporting facts and putting a construction on the evidence or the drawing of conclusions. That is precisely what the Attorney-General has repeatedly done in this answer. I'll hear from the Leader of the House. I'll hear from the Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. The comment from the Attorney-General that that point of order was just raised against was, and I think I'm quoting precisely, those in power need to abide by the law. <laughs> now, it's extraordinary that that's controversial, and that does not need to be seen, that does not need to be seen through the lens of interpreting specific pieces of, of evidence. It can't be the case that that the, the standing orders don't allow the Attorney General to make clear that members of the government need to obey the law. I'm just going to remind the Attorney General not to make any conclusions or give his opinion about what happened at the, Attorney, uh, at the Royal Commission. And if he's got an answer relating to evidence, I ask him to provide that to the Chamber. Otherwise, I will sit him down. He, conclude, he can, in conclusion, continue his answer. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. And let's, let's move away from the Royal Commission. When Labor came to government, it was very clear that there was an urgent need to restore integrity and transparency, which had been so badly eroded by the former Liberal government. This, the former Liberal government reneged on their promise to establish a national anti-corruption commission. They ignored calls for a robo-debt royal commission, and now we know why. The Albanese Labor government has been left with a very big clean-up job to do, but we've all already made important progress, including by legislating for a national anti-corruption commission that will be up and running in coming months. The robo-debt debacle is just one shocking example of what can happen when governments throw accountability aside when they act as if they're above the law. It must never happen again. Yeah. Give a call to member Casey. My question is to the Prime Minister. Kieran, who runs Hutch Co Cafe in Lilydale, a small business in my electorate of Casey, is bracing for the cafe's power bill to increase by $2,438 this year. Signed. The Prime Order. Minister promised Australians Signed. like Kieran that he would cut their power bills by $275. Why has the Prime Minister misled the Australian people? Isn't this yet another broken promise by this tricky Prime Minister? Give a call. Order. Give a call to the Prime Minister. Order. I, I, I thank Kieran 
uh, for his question, uh, or the member for Casey for his question about Kieran, uh, a constituent in his electorate. And I hope that he can tell Kieran uh, that the parliament sat last December and we passed a, a, significant, a significant plan. Uh, we passed a plan for, Order. for a cap on gas prices. The New South Wales Parliament and the Queensland, Queensland administration also put in place uh, price caps on coal. The RBA, the IMF, IEMO and AGL have all confirmed that our plan is working, has made a difference. Uh, the energy price relief plan is something that the member for Casey came in here and voted against. Voted against. And as of the 3rd of February, wholesale electricity forward prices were nearly half that in November. 3rd of February, wholesale electricity forward prices we're nearly half of that in November, and that is in spite of the opposition of those opposite. And I hope he tells Kieran. I hope he tells Kieran that he's sorry that he voted against energy price relief because they vote against everything over there. Don't Order. have any constructive members ideas. Apparently unaware, unaware that you know there's been this uh, international spike because of. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, but apparently, apparently that hasn't happened and hasn't had an impact. Well, it has had an impact right around the world, and we're dealing with practical measures, unlike those opposite, who, unlike their liberal and national counterparts in New South Wales and indeed in, in Queensland, uh, chose chose to just say no. Give a call to the member for Gilmore. My question is to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. How is the Albanese Labor government <clears throat> supporting regional communities to rebuild following natural disasters? What approach has the government adopted and what approaches has it rejected? Give a call to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question and acknowledge the work she continues to do in the recovery effort in her electorate. We know many Australians have been impacted by natural disasters, and only last week we saw remote communities in the Northern Territory evacuated, and the Albanese Labor government stands ready to assist where we can. Floods and fires, cyclones and extreme weather events continue to devastate much of our vast country. Natural disasters and the communities they impact should never be politicised, and we unfortunately have seen this time and time again from those opposite. And now the New South Wales Audit Office has found the New South Wales Liberal National Government chose the same path in bushfire funding. Politics absolutely needs to take a back seat in times of community need. The most important thing that people and communities need to know is that support is available during a disaster. Competitive grant funding the after a disaster minister, doesn't work. The minister will pause the, the manager of opposition business. Mr Speaker, questions are to be asked to ministers about their portfolio responsibilities, not the responsibilities of another government, the New South Wales government. The question was about what approaches have been adopted and rejected. That's, the minister can continue with her answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm going to avoid even commenting on that ridiculous interruption, because competitive grant funding really needs to take a back seat. Order. Because the communities should not be pit against each other in times of disaster. Because in times of disaster, Order. people need to come together Member for recovery. Banks. I don't know if those opposite know that in my electorate. A thousand homes were burnt during the Black Summer bushfire. Two thousand sheds and outbuildings lost. Tens of thousands of kilometres of fence line. And not once in that ten years prior did I see anyone over there saying, "Where's the black spot funding for Eden Monero? Because they're going to need it. Because there's a disaster coming." Not once. Order. You guys had three years under former Prime Minister Morrison, where you had a disaster recovery fund. 
where you collected $800 million on interest and didn't spend a single dollar on a mitigation project. Not a single dollar on recovery. It's absolutely hypocrisy coming from those opposite. And we won't repeat those mistakes, which is why we are committed to the Disaster Ready Fund, a billion dollars over five years so that we can help communities prepare for the next natural disaster. Flood levies, evacuation centres, cyclone shelters. We know it's important, and we know regional communities do best when they work together. When they're not politicised, we get outcomes. Grant funding doesn't need to go to the North Sydney pool. And those opposite should have thought about that when they sent regional dollars there. People and communities Order. spend time and money applying for grant funds, and this side of the House will work with communities to deliver grant funds on an integrity and transparency basis. Our government is committed to working with communities, especially our regions. Our Powering the Regions Plan and the National Reconstruction Fund Order. will bring investment into the our regional communities the on a transparent time basis. Has concluded. Order. I give the call to the member for Barara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Two weeks ago, with the Leader of the Opposition and the Member for O'Connor, I travelled to Laverton and Leonora in Western Australia. The we heard from local leaders that since this government abolished the cashless debit card, there has been an increase in alcohol-related violence and children in those communities not being fed. When will the Prime Minister start listening to the local voices of community calling for the reinstatement of the cashless debit card? Order. Order. I give the call to the Minister for Social Services. Order. Well, thank you much, very much, Mr. Speaker, for the call, and I'd like to thank the member for his question. Of course, there's a lot of emotion around the cashless debit card, and some of those on the other side are using it for political purposes. Order. They're using it in a way to Order. divide communities Members and spread misinformation. Of course, alcohol the misuse, alcohol misuse in remote and rural Australia are due to a complex range of issues, and the goldfields the is no Bay different. Of course, having a look at well, well, of course, reports from the goldfields have been from local police who have reported, as I've stated in this place, that there has been an increase of movement from the NG lands to Kalgoorlie. Leonora Order. and Laverton this summer. Now I Member will McForest. remind the House. I will remind the House that the NG lands were never subject to the cashless debit card. So of course making this connection is misleading. Of course, it has also been publicly reported, which I'm assuming the Leader of the Opposition listened to, that there has been recent royalty payments which have attracted larger groups into town to access these funds. Let I Remember remind Deacon everyone that royalty payments have never been restricted we'll by the cashless debit card. So once again, these connections do not actually add up, and once again as an example of the misinformation. But I would also like to quote some comments from Aboriginal elder uh, Marty Sealander, who said people with serious drinking problems among, among those from vast NG lands who receive infrequent but substantial mining royalties and travel to the Goldfields region to spend their payment on alcohol. That is what the Leader of the Opposition heard, and why he would come into this place and try and mislead and conflate is beyond me. But I will say that we as a government are investing in the things that work. We will invest in the support and services that work. We have continued, my department continues to consult with those regions because not only did we promise and commit money to the existing services that were to end under those opposite, the 1st of July this year, no more money for these sites. Of course, we have not only committed that funding but committed extra funding to the services that work. I will and this government will continue to work with those communities affected by these complex issues to deliver real and lasting solution. We are not going to play politics, even if those on the other side will. Order. 
The House comes to order. I hear from the member for Bendelong. My question is to the Minister for Early Childhood Education. How is the Albanese Labor government delivering on its election commitment to make early childhood education more affordable for Australian families? I call to the Minister for Early Childhood Education and Minister for Youth. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Bannalong for his question. Actually, it was really fantastic to visit the West Ride Neighbourhood Children's Centre with the member for Bannalong last week. The centre is led by the wonderful centre director, Susie, and we got to meet such beautiful children like Lily. And a huge thank you to Lily for the painting of rainbows and love hearts. I particularly enjoyed watching the member for Bennelong pretend to be a human basketball hoop while the children threw their hats at him. It certainly was a sight to be seen. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Albanese government believes that good quality and affordable early childhood education is critical for every Australian child. We know, we know that it can change the trajectory of a child's life. But the benefits, of course, go beyond just children. A well-functioning early learning system pays a triple dividend. It sets children up for a great start in life, it helps families get ahead, and it builds our economic prosperity by supporting workforce participation. And our reforms that were introduced last year will make early learning more affordable for over 1.2 million families right across Australia in electorates like Bennelong, starting from the 1st of July. It's just one of the ways that the Albanese government is providing responsible relief, responsible relief to families that will make a huge difference to their household budgets. The reforms will enable more primary carers, who are predominantly women, to return to work, to take on extra work if they so wish, to contribute to the household income, to go back to university or to back to study if they so wish. And I visited early centres right across Australia, from Bennelong to Reed to Swan to Boothby to Wills and Aston. And everywhere I go, families are telling me how relieved they are that the Labor government is living up to its promise and making it more affordable for early childhood education. But I also get to see firsthand the fantastic work of early childhood educators. In the words of Georgie Gent, Dent from Parenthood, a wonderful advocate for the value of early learning, she says, investment in early childhood education and care is an investment in building the nation's social capital. It's an investment in the future prosperity of the country and just as important as physical infrastructure. Well, the Albanese Labor government is making investments in Australian children and families, mm -hmm. investments that make a real difference to their lives. We're delivering on our commitments to the Australian people mm -hmm. and we're giving children the best start in life and making a real difference to household budgets of Australian families. Yeah. Order. I give the call to the member. For Order. I give the call. Members on my right. I give the call to the member for Hume. The question is to the treasurer. Has the treasurer seen advice from Treasury that the so-called half a percent of people affected by their super changes grows to 10 percent of Australians? I give the call to the treasurer. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It took until 3.24 to, to break the pea-hearted silence of the Shadow Treasurer. 3.24. We had to sit here for an hour and a half to wait for a question from the Shadow Order. Treasurer. He hasn't asked me one since November, Mr Speaker, and after all of that waiting, that's the best that he can come up with. What a joke, Mr Speaker. Now, the answer to his question is this, and I know that it comes from questioning in the Senate where they did have the courage to ask some questions about superannuation in the Senate today, ah. not like the pea-hearted approach of those opposite here at the Shadow Treasurer. But the answer that the Shadow Treasurer is referring to, the answer that the Shadow Treasurer is referring to, is that right now, in 2025, less than half of one percent of people will be impacted. Order. By the time we let me Order. finish, let me wait for it, wait for it, let me finish. By the beginning of next decade, it will be around one percent. And the answer that Senator Gallagher, Minister Gallagher, the great finance minister in the other place, gave a moment ago is in 30 years, one in 10 people will be impacted by it. 
This is the number that the shadow treasurer thinks is some kind of stunning insight. The lengths that they will go to, Mr. Speaker, the lengths that they will go to to hide what should be their shame-faced embarrassment. Order. That we can't get a question. We can't get a question from the shadow treasurer about energy bills. We can't get about, about housing affordability. Remember we can't get about manufacturing Remember and the National Fairfax Reconstruction Fund. But this bloke will go to the wall weeks. for half a percent of people getting big tax breaks in the superannuation system. Now, what we are proposing, Mr. Speaker, is a modest change, but it is a simple choice. Order. And on this side of the house, on this side of the house, when we inherit a trillion dollars of Liberal Party debt and deficits as far as the eye can see, and unfunded Broome. ongoing commitments and intensifying pressures in the budget. We say that the generous concessions in superannuation for half a per cent of people can be a little bit less generous. We know what those opposite do when the budget's under pressure. They victimise and they demonise people, the most vulnerable people in this country, with robo-debt. And they come after Medicare Order. like the member for Dixon did the last time that the Liberals were in office. Now, Mr Speaker, as those opposites splash around and thrash around in the shallowest and muddiest puddles of political opportunism, on this side of the House the adults will continue to make serious decisions about serious pressures on the budget that we inherited from Order. those opposite, and we will continue to make the right calls for the right reasons to clean up the mess that they left us. Yeah. Order. Give the call to the member. Order the, the member for Hume and the Treasurer will cease interjecting. The member for Hume and the Leader of the Opposition. Order in the House is the Leader of the Opposition, the Treasurer. I give the call to I give the call to the for, the for a first. I give the call to the member for Macon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. What steps is the Albanese government taking to deliver defence capability and support Australian defence industry? Why are these policies important, and how do the policies of the Albanese Labor government compare to a decade of coalition neglect? I give the call to the Minister for Defence. The, the Treasurer and the member for Hume are warned. That sort of yelling across the chamber is completely unacceptable. You are both on warnings. I give the call to the Minister for Defence Industry and the Minister for International Development in the Pacific. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Macon from the great city of Adelaide for his question. The truth is, Mr Speaker, we face the greatest strategic uncertainty since World War II, and it's critical that we have a defence procurement system that works efficiently delivering the equipment the ADF needs. We also need a sovereign Australian defence industry to support that. But the truth is, Mr Speaker, that we inherited a mess—28 major defence projects running 97 years late, battlefield airlift planes that couldn't fly into battlefields. Helicopters running more than 10 years late, available less than 50 per cent of the time. Patrol boats built with imported substandard aluminium that gets the, get this, rust in salt water. This was a mess driven by the incompetence of those opposite. Nine years Order. of defence and defence industry ministers are asleep at the wheel. Asleep at the wheel. By contrast, the Deputy Prime Minister and I took immediate action and announced six significant reforms to defence procurement. This included driving greater ministerial focus and energy through regular ministerial summits to fix projects of concern. And I'll be conducting the second ministerial summit this month. The second Order. summit in four months. In contrast, the second summit in four months compared to Order. six summits in a long nine years by those opposite. I can also inform the House that today the Independent Project Management Office has been established within Defence to help drive reforms to the defence procurement system, delivering to the ADF the equipment they need. Now, Mr Speaker, complementing an efficient procurement system is a sovereign Australian defence industry. This is something the Albanese government is deeply committed to. 
whether it's through the National the Reconstruction Petrie. Fund or our commitment to build nuclear-propelled submarines in Adelaide, we want our defence industry to prosper. It's good for Aussie jobs and it's great for our national security. And I've recently returned from the Munich Security Conference, where I met with the German Defence Minister and the global head of Rheinmetall, where we had great conversations about Rheinmetall building boxer vehicles in Queensland to export to Germany. This will be the biggest export deal in our defence history. The Albanese government is working hard on this, and that's the difference between the government and the opposition. We want to grow jobs through defence exports. They want to export defence jobs. We saw that when they tried to send the submarine contract to Japan, and only last week the Leader of the Opposition surrendered on Aussie jobs and advocated building our nuclear submarines overseas. He cut Adelaide loose. Only the Albanese government can be trusted to fight for an Australian defence industry because we know it's vital to our national security. Has concluded. Order. The member for Page. I want to hear from the member for Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Last week, I met with a young woman from Western Sydney about her petition Make Medicare Funded Access to 20 Psychology Sessions Permanent, which has received over 41. Thousand signatures. She said it's extremely infuriating to hear the health minister say consumers of mental health are not asking for this decision to be overturned. When Order. I know my supporters have sent countless emails to his office, why isn't the minister listening to people with lived experience? And when will the minister return Order. the psychology sessions he cut? Order. The. Minister for Health and Aged Care has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Lindsay for her question. Uh, I'm not sure she may want to indicate whether she lobbied the former minister uh, to make those additional 10 sessions permanent, because, as she would know, the former government made the decision Order. that they would terminate on the 31st of December 2022. Uh, that decision was not changed in the March budget last year. The last budget that was delivered by the former Order. government. Perhaps the member for Lindsay lobbied the former minister for that. I have not heard that. I have seen no correspondence to that effect. As far as I know, every single member across the opposition, now opposition backbenchers, uh, were quite happy with the decision that the former minister, uh, Greg Hunt, the had made. Now, the decision we took to essentially support the position of the former government was informed by the evaluation of the Better Access Program which I have outlined Order. to this parliament a number of times before. And the essential conclusion of that was that the additional 10 sessions, far from making access better, which is the name of this program, it made access worse. That tens and tens of thousands of potential patients Order. could not get into the system at all. The evaluation also found that the additional 10 sessions did not go to people with any more complex needs than those who were not getting the additional 10 sessions. Well, I hear an interjection from the member for Lindsay that it's not true. I can't remember the exact words, but Order. the evaluation found that the baseline mental health of those who received the additional sessions was almost identical to the baseline mental health of those who did not receive the additional sessions. Now, I am, I am uh, consulting, along with the Assistant Minister of Mental Health, with the sector very broadly about ways in which we can make better access more equitable, ways in which Order, we can make better access more accessible for those communities who are missing the out and who, frankly, have been missing out for the almost two decades of this program, which has seen seen disproportionately these services delivered to wealthier suburbs in inner city suburbs instead of those in the outer suburbs and in regional communities. Order. We're committed to making this a sustainable, equitable program. Now the member for Lindsay also says, why are we not listening to those with lived experience? Well, in the Order. 2012 budget, when I was the Minister of Mental Health, we set aside funding to Order. set up lived experience organisations to give consumers a voice in the delivery and deliberations around mental health policy. And who cut that? Who cut that? The now Leader of the Opposition 
who was the health minister, the worst health minister in the modern history of health, Order. cut the funding we had set aside to give consumers a voice in the development of mental health policy. Now, I'm really proud that the Assistant Minister of Mental Health, ten years too late because of those opposite, have finally reintroduced funding to give consumers a structured voice in the delivery of Order. mental health policy in this country. The time has concluded. The member for Lindsay will cease interjecting. And I give the call to the member for Wills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. How is the Albanese Labor government supporting the economic participation and inclusion of refugees in our community? I give the call to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Thanks, Speaker, and I thank the member for Wills for his question. I know these are issues that he is deeply committed to and matter a lot to his constituents. Now, I'm very proud, Mr Speaker, to be part of a government that's committed to changing the tenor of our national debate on refugees, as we also ensure that our policies make a practical difference to the lives of refugees and to the communities we welcome them into. And this government understands that a successful humanitarian program must consider the entire settlement journey of a refugee, from the point when someone steps off a plane in Australia for the first time to gaining secure employment. We are dedicated to making sure that our newest Australians are able to rebuild their lives, not just in safety, but with stability, security and so that they can fulfil their potential and make the contribution to communities that are so desperately needed and which is so important to each one of those entrants. Now, we also believe in the power of a strong community sponsorship model. And I acknowledge that's something that's shared across this chamber, I believe. I believe that's something we all support. But critically, we are committed to making this additional to the government refugee intake. We know that through harnessing the enthusiasm and the generosity of the Australian community, we are able to match UNHCR-referred refugees with local community groups who provide an extraordinary support, an extraordinary wraparound support, practical and in-kind support, settlement integration support, including lots of help with finding housing, um, navigating the journey towards schooling for children, work and learning English. From Gosford to Wanthaggy, we've seen families welcomed, welcomed with open arms by their sponsors and wider communities who are helping them navigate the journey into Australian society, helping them to more quickly fully participate in their communities and the economy. I'm so pleased that many of these entrants are already participating in the labour market. I'm also pleased that we have programs that support this journey becoming more complete recognising that whilst entrants who come through humanitarian pathways are highly motivated to work, they face unique barriers. And that's why this week I was pleased to make a number of announcements supporting social enterprises. At Parliament on King with my friend the member for Sydney, an extraordinary venue and also with the member for McNamara, where I announced $7.5 million in funding to Victorian social enterprises, ensuring that people who come here through humanitarian pathways get every opportunity to make their contribution at wonderful places like Space to Be in St Kilda, which has provided a pathway to secure employment for 95 per cent—95 per cent, Mr Speaker, of the refugees who come through there, including through its on-site cafe. This cafe, run by Nairan, a person currently on a TPV but who will soon be able to become a permanent resident and develop her business. Her cafe is more than just financial stability. It's a way in which she can give back to this country. Has concluded. I give the call to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Was the Prime Minister aware of the Treasury advice that one in ten Australians will be affected by their proposed super changes when he made public commentary on this matter Order. last week? If so, if so, if so, Prime Minister, what is your advice to a 37-year-old making investment decisions today into their superannuation who would be affected by these changes? I give a call to the Prime Minister. Order. My, my, my advice. I, I thank the leader of the opposition for his question. My, my advice. My advice to. Uh, a 37-year-old would be, listen to old Angus, not new Angus. <laughs> because in June 2016... Order. In the Prime Minister will ask a question. Oh, ask Just a question. resume your seat. The Prime Minister will refer to members by their title. Oh. Well, the, the, the shadow treasurer. 
Of course, the shadow treasurer uh, in June 20. On a point of order, I'll hear from the leader of the opposition. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, on relevance, it was a straight question. It didn't require Resume a slippery seat. answer. Resume your seat. The there is no point of order, but I'll hear from the Leader of the House. Oh, no, it's fine. Yeah. The <laughs> Prime Minister will continue. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Order. Order. The question was about advice from the Prime Minister. He is answering the question. I give him the call, and he'll be heard in silence. He, he, he's very angry, Mr Speaker. He Order. Save the yelling for the New South Wales Liberals campaign launch on Sunday. Save it for that. This is what the Shadow Treasurer had Order. to say. The situation we had was some people were contributing millions of dollars in the super, and it's totally inappropriate that someone who's contributed millions and millions of dollars continues to get those 15 per cent concessions. That's what they had to say. Fantastic job. Well done, Angus. Fantastic. Great job. It was, after, it was after the Treasurer's budget speech that year where, where the tr then Treasurer, the member for Cook, had this to say. We will be reducing access to generous superannuation tax concessions for the most wealthy. Now, today they've come in here. We've let question time go for over an hour and a half. They've finally got to asking a question about super. And what they talk about is something that happens in 30 years. Even though, when they made the changes in section 293, in section 293 they didn't index it. Income tax rates, they don't index it. In, in 30 years' time, in 30 years' time, I make this prediction. I make this bold prediction. In 30 years' time. Some Order. people will be earning more than they are today in dollar terms, and, and some people will be paying different income tax rates in 30 years than they are now, and different people will be contributing section two nine, under section 293 in terms of superannuation. The changes that they delivered in 2016-17. But the difference is this, Mr. Speaker. Our, our tax changes affect one half of one per cent. The Prime yeah. Minister the Prime Minister will the, the Prime, Prime Minister will pause. I'll, I'll hear from the member. Order. One, one at a time. Order. The House will come to order. The member will resume his seat. I didn't hear what the Treasurer said. I'm asking if he would withdraw to assist the House. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. The difference, the order. difference is this. Our changes affect half of 1%. Their changes affected 4 per cent. 4 per cent. They weren't indexed. They had an impact the, the, of $5 the billion. $5 billion. Our modest changes. Our modest changes. Prime Minister's time has concluded. Uh, Order. Hear from the member for Fremantle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care. This weekend marked the anniversary of the shocking final report from the Royal Commission to Aged Care, Quality and Safety. What actions is the Albanese Labor government taking to address the aged care crisis and to deliver the care that older Australians deserve? Yeah. Give the call to the Minister for Aged Care and Sport. Um, I thank the member for Fremantle for his question, and I know that he has been very engaged with aged care facilities in his electorate, like the Italian Village, a facility that provides culturally and linguistically diverse care to older Australians. 
March 1 marked two years since the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety's shocking final report was tabled in the Parliament. It was damning in its assessment of the aged care system. It showed us stomach-churning evidence of how our most vulnerable people were being treated, maggots in the wounds of older Australians and two-thirds of people in residential care, malnourished or at risk of malnourishment, people who were supposed to be being cared for literally not getting enough food to eat. The Royal Commission told us all that we must do better, we must be better, and this government is not wasting a single day. These are not new problems, but we are giving new energy to fixing them. And we have already directly addressed 37 Royal Commission recommendations. That is four times more than what those opposite did in 17 months. We are putting nurses back into nursing homes 24-7 to improve clinical care and to reduce trips Order. to hospital. We are putting in mandatory minimum care minutes from the 1st of October this year, a deserved pay rise for our workforce to recognise their work properly, a rise supported by this government. The star rating system to increase choice, accountability and transparency. The inaugural code of conduct to protect older people. Capping home care charges and exit fees to stop the rorting. And enhancing safeguards for restrictive practices. And this only scratches the surface of the critical reforms that we have and have to tackle in the coming months and years as we are working hard to set up the sector for long-term success. Aged care has had a very difficult de decade, Mr Speaker, but I see a bright, positive and ambitious future for this sector. Those opposite do not share this optimism. They continue to talk down the sector. They continue to talk down the recommendations of the Royal Commission. They even talk down the need for round-the-clock nursing and for the right to older people to access round-the-clock nursing. The minister will pause. I call the manager of opposition on a point of order. Again, it goes to relevance. The question was that the actions that this government has taken to address the aged care crisis, it was not an invitation to go into the record of the previous government. I ask the minister to return to the question. She has the call. Mr Speaker, I'm talking about the urgent need for reform in aged care asked of us by the Royal Commission due to the actions and neglect of those opposite. Yeah. Because you could certainly they might accuse us of rushing reform in aged care. You certainly couldn't accuse them of rushing anything in aged care because it is very hard to rush neglect, Mr Speaker. You really have to let it wither on the vine. They could not commit to 24-7 nurses. They could not commit to a base standard of care minutes for our older Australians. They could not commit to a pay rise for aged care workers. But they remain and remain steadfastly committed to neglect neglecting the duty of care and the standard required in aged care. This government will not apologise for being ambitious for aged care. We will keep working. We will keep fighting. Even though complex, the reform required is complex, it is difficult. We remain committed to the task. We remain Order. committed to older Australians. I call the Prime Minister. Oh. Order. Oh. The, the member from the Verena will resume his seat immediately. <laughs> Order. <laughs> give a call to the Prime Minister. I look forward to two o'clock tomorrow <laughs> the Prime Minister uh, has the I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.